now we uh, will go to more and discuss the kinetics. And Hans Schultz from Kalru will talk about the kinetics of HDS, HDN, and hydrogenation. It's uh, now some, it's only some 50, 60 years. The since the catalysts have been invented by Matthias Pier and his group in the 1930, 1930-1945. Uh, first one, the iron for the but then particularly for gas phase conversion of the liquid products from coal hydrogenation and they nicely developed the chromos, nemos, nickel tungsten, or alumina for refining reaction HDO, HDN, HDS, then for cracking, for hydrocracking the same one on the acidic, on the acidic uh, uh, carrier and also an aromatization process which is in, in its chemistry almost the same as our present reform process. So we can think what is the progress in between. In the meantime, I think uh, we are still now in progress in evaluating what's going on on the surface, we are trying to understand those catalysts on a higher level. Uh, the system seems to be highly dynamic, and it's uh, not so easy to find out what the ruling principles are because it's a multi-parameter system. So I want to point out a few things mainly. The one is the, the principle of generation of a reactive and weak bonds through hydrogenation. Those compounds which we have to convert normally, <coughs> they, are, they have survived over millions of years and so on within the, the, the fossil fuels and so they are relatively stable. And uh, so it turns out that this is the principle here for most of the reactions that we have to create reactive bonds through hydrogenation, partial hydrogenation. Then the other thing is the formation of unsaturated compounds through hydrogenolysis. We get originally mainly olefins and primary hydrocarbon products. And then another very important point, selectivity control through hydrogen availability. Whatever hydrogen availability means, but I think this is very much controlling all the reactions in a kinetic sense. And then alternate reaction routes in kilodine, particularly in conversion, and uh, perhaps a little catalyst specificity variation. So <coughs> the weak points. For instance, uh, it's a nice question what HDN activity means. If we look uh, onto the con uh, conversion of inner line, and then the nitrogen is nicely shielded in this aromatic ring and only after hydrogenation this bond, uh, this bond becomes weak, weak in memory. this one becomes weak, but this one is still strong and so this one is a, a split in the later step and uh, now after hydrogenation of this ring as a slow reaction this bond becomes weak and it's easily split and we end up mainly with the olefin as a precursor of the uh, saturated compound. With the thiophene, similarly, the original compound is more or less aromatic, must be hydrogenated, so we then have created the weak bond, which is split, and we come to the hydrocarbon. If we have, <coughs> the, for instance, here the benzofurane, these are compounds related perhaps to coal-derived liquids, and then we see the oxygen-containing ring is being hydrogenated, so this bond becomes weak, it is split, and then the aromatic ring hydrogenation is very slow. We have to wait until this performs. Then we come to a very reactive compound, which uh, here the bonding is the bond is very weak, and we get the hydrogenation. With the benzo with the thiophene, benzo thiophene, this thing is again different than we saw yesterday, for instance. Here already these sulfur carbon bonds are relatively weak, so that the major reaction can be the desulfurization without hydrogenation of these both rings. On the other hand, if you take the same structure with oxygen, then the events of furane yields as a primary product with high, with high selectivity, uh, the, uh, just a cyclohexane, which means that in the original step, 
to destabilize this bond and also these two aromatic rings. So we suggest that you hydrogenate this, this edge and break this bond. Then everything is easy and very fast to heal the cyclexin as primary product. So it, it appears that in most of these reactions of removal of salt oxygen, salt, or made of nitrogen and oxygen, also sulfur, that creation of weak bonds through partial hydrogenation is a very general principle. <coughs> So, so we are interested in atoms uh, mainly occurring in fossil fuels, stable structures, uh, mainly five, six membered rings with aromatic character. These com commonly in parts are of larger polynuclear substances, and the monobenzo derivates are most suited as models for evaluation of elemental reaction steps, substituted. Dibenzo derivates uh, may be models for, to reveal important steric effects. Then the basic monocytic structures could be models, and they could be very useful then for the understanding of the dynamic catalytic system in itself without steric effects and so on. And only, that's a nice point, only real fields, yes, may be looked to determine now HDS, HDO, HDN activity. This is some, some overall activity of the catalyst only to be related to real deeds. It's not very reasonable to use these expressions when converting individual compounds. <coughs> My other point, the formation of olefins, of olefins, of unsaturated compounds, when, <coughs> when converting these uh, hetero compounds, and then the reaction mechanisms in many cases are that you will initially hydrogenate the aromatic rings and so on, end up with a reactive OH group or NH2 group or SH group. This bond is being split and you come to something like a radical or a sigma bonded alkyl group to the surface. And now and this, there are two pathways mainly how this can be stabilized. The one which might be thought to be the easiest that this one finds another hydrogen <coughs> so that you obtain something like an associative heavy desorption <coughs> reaction from the surface to heal the saturated compound, the paraffin, this turns out to be not the easy step. Normally, the better elimination of the hydrogen is the fastest, the easy step, so that the primary product, the olefin, <coughs> and this is only secondary hydrogenated. On the other hand, if there is scarcity of hydrogen in the system, then this species has to look for other uh, substrates to react with and may react with another uh, molecule of the field or what is just the way around. So this is again very much governed by the hydrogen availability on the surface and on the other hand, the primary products, the reaction pathway is splitting here in the one or the other direction and the primary products of now these other things, and then so far these products, even in earlier times when we're using the phenols and the core liquids were not stable <coughs> because of the content in these in these in olefins and unsaturated compounds from the uh, partial hydrogenation of partial hydrogenation for the initial feed molecule. So, what <coughs> we draw a few statements. H metal elimination to form the olefin is very important. H addition to form a saturated compound is very normally slower. Addition into another substrate is very important. This may be the pathway in direction to a higher molecular weight compound to cope with cursors and so on. And that the hydrogen availability favors the primary formation of the saturated compounds the secondary hydrogenation of polyphenes and it suppresses condensation reactions and co-formation. So we should also always think also of the olefins as a product in, uh, of uh, HDS, HDN reactions and take it also into account when characterizing these catalysts. <coughs> the fate of the olefins themselves in many instances 
one observes for prime, as a primary selectivity something like 20%, 10 to 20% of the paraffin and some 80 to 90% of the olefin as a primary product. So this is in past uh, reaction the common thing. The further fate of the olefin is that the first step of addition of hydrogen seems to be relatively fast and reversible so that and the second one, the second addition is relatively slow and irreversible. So that under conditions of only partial hydrogenation, the conversion of, of double bond shift to get the double bond shift is really this isomerization. This the conversion is faster than the hydrogenation of the olefin to get the paraffin. So this is very indicative, and this is very consistent in many, many systems. The first addition of the hydrogen to the double bond relatively fast to yield this intermediate. The second step to be comparatively slow. Uh, I want uh, to convince a little more about the, the importance of hydrogen availability in these systems. Uh, with the results from converting the furin, the furin on a combo catalyst at 300 degrees Celsius at very at different pressures of hydrogen, <coughs> only around 1 bar, about, around 10, about 10 bar, about 50 bar, about 100 bar. And uh, in this case here, you see the expected product, the butane, butane selectivity here, at a function of conversion. So, <coughs> as to be expected, the, this increases with degree of conversion. But when looking here at the 30% conversion degree, what the selectivity of the butane is, then we see that only at the 100 bar, we get the desired product, the parent and the butane. Already at the 45 degrees, these are only 70% of the butane. At the 9 bar, then there are only some 10, 20. And here, if we are even at 1 bar, then we are <coughs> here at 5% of the butane. And it turns out 1 bar of hydrogen that is not a very relevant, not a very relevant condition to inspect catalysts of this kind for their usefulness, perhaps in hydrocritic reactions. If we look here what the selectivity of the olefins is with uh, this furane hydrodeoxygenation. The, the selectivity of olefin taken as fraction olefin per <coughs> group of C4 olefin per olefin and, and uh, paraffins together, molar fraction, as <coughs> a function of the total yield of uh, the C4 hydrocarbons. And then we see the olefin selectivity with the 100 bar experiment. This is, this is actually now low. The olefin selectivity it increases a little, but already at around the 50 bars, at 30% conversion, the olefin selectivity is some 20, 30 degree. If we come to these 10 bar or so, then we are at a selectivity, at a selectivity here of 60%. And if we have only the one bar area, then we produce almost only olefins, or many olefins, as the products of the oxygenation of the purine. If we look what the olefins are, this is the alpha olefin within the fraction of C4 olefins as a function of hydrocarbon yield. Uh, then we observe that the alpha olefin seems to be the primary product of low degrees of conversion. It's mainly alpha olefin. If uh, then we <coughs> at higher pressures and so on, then we all these lines come to the equilibrium where some 20% of the olefin, olefin, uh, alpha olefin is in the equilibrium together with the beta olefin C4. Then another nice extra reaction in this system at the low hydrocarbon, at low pressure of hydrogen, we observe a high selectivity of pyrophene. 
nice extract for you, which maybe explain in such a way that the furane adds in hydrogen and uh, may react from this form or from that form. Uh, there may be added the SH group as much as H available in the system. And then from here we have the exchange between SH and O without opening of the ring to then finally come to the TIP, which is now just a suggestion, but nevertheless it would work perhaps in such a way. And on the other hand, there's again another extra reaction for this type of compound because the oxygen tries to, to uh, escape and uh, has a fire decarbonization reaction. Uh, the CO is being formed. And so far, one obtains then from a C4 compound, a C1 and a C3 compound. So here the C3 selectivity is given selectivity as a molar fraction of the total hydrocarbons at the function of yield of all the hydrocarbons. And so we see that uh, this is more or less conversion independent. However, that the selectivity of decarbonization increases with decrease of partial pressure of hydrogen. So actually, this small molecule and this is a reaction pathway, suggestion for that, that at this <coughs> point here, we have the alternative routes that it continues as generally <coughs> to be accepted in direction to the butane, or that it loses one hydrogen here <coughs> to come to the carbon new compound, which uh, <coughs> releases the CO then and yields the fragmentation to C to C3 and the C1. And so it just turns out hydrogen availability strongly governs these systems and we must be very aware of this when drawing conclusions what the, what the, the chemistry is, what in particular what the chemists do and what the sites are. This must be taken very individual and it's only, only reasonable, reasonable to draw conclusions when you control the parameters and normally you have to work at the higher hydrogen partial pressures if your work shall be in some, <coughs> some extent be relevant to actual hypertreating uh, conversions. <coughs> it's, uh, it's nice to inform our older work <coughs> to compare Cobos and Nemos catalysts. Uh, in this case during <coughs> thiophene uh, desulfurization and inspecting the product composition here at the same space time. In this case, at the, here, at the same degree of conversion. <coughs> the mechanism being here the hydrogenation of the thiophene, that is thiophene to the tetrahydrothiophene. The ring is being split. The olefin is a major product being observed, and that is the final product of paraffin. And so we, we just uh, look onto the degree of conversion for hope, then we see that the degree of conversion is highest at the same space time for the cobalt molybdenum, higher than for the nemos and the nickel tanks. It's more active, more active for the first reaction step. The way the result, and then look what the composition of these reaction products is. And we take this fraction, molar fraction of C5 hydrocarbons and divided by uh, tetrahydrothiophene and uh, the sum of C5 hydrocarbons. Then this is the part which uh, then this uh, concerns splitting, the splitting of uh, this uh, bond between the sulfur, or that, between sulfur and carbon, and the uh, splitting activity. Uh, then we see that the, this value is highest for the nickel tanks and is lower, in any case, lower for the cobalt molybdenum. This means cobalt will have the higher hydrogenation activity, the lower splitting activity. And on the other hand, I'm <coughs> looking what the paraffin, the, the paraffin <coughs> fraction in the C5 hydrocarbons is for these catalysts we again see that this fraction is highest for the cobalt 
Kobalt, and lowest for the nickel tungsten. The cobalt has here again the higher hydrogenation activity, and the nickel tungsten has the lower, has the higher, the higher fragmentation activity. <coughs> this, <coughs> these catalysts can be compared also in a different way. They may be, they may be. <coughs> Uh, used to convert the mixture of these five of these uh, four compounds at a relatively high uh, partial pressure of hydrogen at around 100 bar, and uh, their concentrations in the feed being relatively low, so that competitive absorption is not a strong thing here. And uh, we have uh, conducted a number of experiments at different temperatures on drawn from those the degree to the point, the temperature, for a 50% conversion. These temperatures are given here, <coughs> and the, the lower this temperature for 50% conversion, the higher the activity of the catalyst. So if we compare chromos and limos, we see that for the thiophene, thiophene hydroxysulfurization, the temperature is lower, reaction temperature for the <coughs> for the chromos, the chromos is more reactive to remove the sulfur. When we go to the uh, to the other line, <coughs> we see that the chromos needs a higher temperature, the 360 degrees centigrade to remove the nitrogen, and then the nemos and the, the 334 degrees, the lower temperature for removal of the nitrogen. However, both reactions primarily are hydrogenation reactions. And uh, so my conclusion drawn from this is that the cobalt catalyst uh, develops its activity at a lower temperature. The active sites are generated at a lower temperature and, and this is then sufficient for hydrogen On the other hand, <coughs> the denitrogenation needs a higher temperature and uh, at this higher temperature and then there are created also more uh, centers and the centers of higher activity on the on the NEMOS so that now the NEMOS catalyst at the higher temperature becomes turns out to be the more active one even for hydrogenation reaction. That's again a somewhat uh, dynamic interpretation of this uh, uh, kind of catalyst. I, uh, there are several other things I could talk about. For instance, <coughs> But of course, it's a white deal. And uh, so I want <coughs> to draw your attention on this kind of experiments where we change the partial pressure of one of those four compounds in the mixture the phenol, the aniline, the thiophene, and the aromatic compound. And the one sees that when changing only the partial pressure of the phenol, the phenol conversion declines, it's less than first order. And uh, however, the conversion of the aniline is not at all affected, even at these three different temperatures. Whereas, when making the same experiment with <coughs> change of the concentration in the B, or the aniline, the thiophene in this case, then the conversion, degree of conversion of the phenol is seriously affected and decreased, so that this shows strongly the inhibiting effect of the, of the aniline on these sites which may have uh, more as compared to that. <laughs> and, uh, and then so far, this is a strong, uh, strong effect in the system as well. It's, it's just uh, one, one, uh, finalizing, <coughs> one finalizing slide. And uh, this uh, gives a comparison, a comparison of the reaction mechanism of uh, kinolin conversion and uh, isokinolin conversion. And uh, <coughs> in the kinolin conversion, this red, I uh, indicate the main reaction pathway. But uh, with the catalyst of higher hydrogenation activity, also this pathway uh, becomes important. And the 5678 tetrahydro is an important intermediate. Then we go this way, undergoing an iron catalyst, for instance, and the direct 
splitting of this NH group, NH2 group from the ring becomes important. So the mechanism changes with conditions, the mechanism changes with hydrogen availability, with contagious, little changes in the catalyst, and so far again the slow step will be a different one. And the, the, major, the major difference when we got now HDN selectivity, for instance, when taking here the isoquinoline, this nitrogen is not bonded then. We first get just the, the dehydro, the dehydro compounds, and then, then this nitrogen is no longer bonded to the aromatic ring and can be easily removed from this compound without hydrogenation of the last ring. So this is, again, in terms of reaction steps, totally different this mechanism as compared with the other one, just having the hard nitrogen in this position or the other position. So my, my uh, major uh, comment or statement to the system is that uh, it's, it's very dynamic, it's, a, it's very, <coughs> the catalyst itself, the, the reaction pathways, these are multi-step reactions, there are so many parameters involved that we want to learn something about. We have to study isolated, isolated systems, and then tr try to bring our knowledge together to tie up the total picture. Right. Thank you. Well, this presentation is now open for questions and comments. Thank you, Brazil. Thank you, Brazil. You have discussed various selectivities, for instance, selectivity of formation of polyphines, and all the data presented concern uh, promoted catalysts. Do you have any experience with the behavior of molybdenum? catalyst in comparison with promoted uh, catalyst as for selectivity behavior? Uh, we, we don't have made these experiments, but it turns out that this is a very general principle in the heterogeneous catalysis, and we have this the same chemistry in Fischer-Tropsch reactions, where we end up with an alkyl group, and from there, this alkyl group has the same options to, to be an olefin, to be a paraffin, the olefin being, uh, being secondary hydrogenated or isomerized or so. This seems to be very generic in all the systems of strong inhibition of hydrogenation activity, where you just not get the fast reaction to the paraffin, where you have as well than the easy exchange of the first hydrogen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, your point is very well taken about the effects of hydrogen must be considered in reaction kinetics and other factors. Uh, what I'm not quite sure I agree with is, uh, is the statement that uh, the hydrogen pressure changes the mechanism. I would like to consider that it uh, really did that, that it's in the reaction rate constants in some in some functional form, and that if you can account for this, you can account for the effects of hydrogen uh, without assuming a mechanistic change. Okay, in, the, in that diagram you should different pathways, but these can all exist at the same time, but under certain conditions, those rates would be low, and other conditions they will be higher. So I, I suggest the mechanism of the reaction may not be different. The, 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 the kinetics effect of it. But for me, it's more a question of semantics, what the, what the uh, reaction mechanism is, yes. I normally, with the reaction pathways, changes drastically and the product yes, is uh, now produced on another line even when the other lines are still present but it's now only one percent of the total then i say it's a different mechanism but nevertheless yes, they are still there yes. <coughs> well questions comments otherwise we have a lot of things to think about during the coffee break and thank you once again.